people. Welcome. It's good to be back. It's uh, Wednesday. It's week 10. Oh, I don't know how you guys, do you guys count the break as week 9 and this is week 10? So this is week 9, do you guys? Well, I don't care what you count. My calendar says week 10, so therefore it's week 10. It's a ninth real week, I guess, right? Whatever. Uh, maybe it depends whether you count starting from 0 or 1, right? Um, computer science stuff. We've been doing graphs. We're basically done with graphs at this point. Uh, of course, there's a ton more you could say about graphs, but we will have to save that for some other class another day. And um, we also have talked a little bit about inheritance. I'll talk a little more about that today. The eighth and last homework assignment is now up. It went up yesterday. It's, uh, it's a one-parter. I know you're sick of all these multi-part assignments, so the last two assignments, you guys just have one part each. Uh, homework eight is called uh, Stanford one, two, three. You have to make a spreadsheet. It's basically a really ordinary, dumpy version of like Excel or Google Sheet or something like that. Um, the hard part of the assignment is recalculating all the formulas, like if the cells refer to each other, like this one equals that one times that one or something. You have to calculate all those values and there's dependencies between the values. I want you to represent the cells in the spreadsheet using a graph, a basic graph object. So the assignment spec talks about all that. There's also different types of values that can go in a cell. It could be just a number, or it could be a reference to a cell, or it could be a formula, or it could be a function over a range of cells. There are these different types of values that can go in a cell, and those values are represented as objects in an inheritance hierarchy, and you have to implement a small part of that behavior to evaluate the values of the cells. So there's a little bit of inheritance uh, in there. So anyway, you can take a look at that later. It's due Friday of next week, so it's due you know, down here. Uh, I just want to clarify, you know, you probably don't want to turn in homework eight and late would be my recommendation because that weekend would be the time that you could study for our final, which will be the following Monday. So if you take a late day on assignment eight, you're eating into your final exam study time, so I don't recommend it. There's another thing, which is because we have to get grading on the homeworks, I can only let you use one late day at most on homework eight. I can't take it more than one day late. So uh, regardless of if you have late days left, it won't be accepted after that Monday at six. So. I guess like if you're feeling, uh, if you like to live dangerously, you could take a late day on homework eight, you could go take the final Monday morning on the 11th of December, and then at 11.30, you could race back to your dorm, and you have about six hours to finish homework eight before the turn-in page cuts off. I do not endorse this idea, but hey, you know, some of you like excitement and adventure. <laughs> that is living dangerously, yeah. Um, Okay, anyway, so having said all of that, uh, what we're going to do today and tomorrow, I'm going to do more inheritance today, and then I'm going to move on to talk about how hash collections are implemented, hash set, hash map. Uh, my goal is to get a little bit into the hashing today, even though it's listed as tomorrow's topic. I'm just trying to get a little ahead on some of this stuff, and uh, your section will have some problems about inheritance and hashing this week as well. Okay, so let's go back to my slides on inheritance. We already know what inheritance is. It's when classes are related to each other, when they're based on each other, kind of a parent-child relationship, a base class and a derived class. I showed you some of the syntax for inheritance. Uh, do you remember in C++, how do you indicate that one class is a subclass of another? How do you say that? You just put a colon and then put the parent class name. Right, so like we had a class called, oh, this is the wrong uh, one. Um, we had a class called employee, and the employee looks like Looks like this, right? Just with some very simple methods of getting vacation and salary and stuff like that. And um, then we found that if you wanted to write a class called lawyer, the lawyer says that it extends employee with this colon here, right? Okay. So that was most of it. Then the other thing was I taught you this word virtual. What is that all about? Why do I need to know about that when I do inheritance? What does that do? <coughs> yes? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Basically just, it indicates to the compiler that it's okay with you if the subclasses override this method. Uh, if you really want to know a little more about it, the idea here, uh, there's a concept called dynamic method binding, sometimes called virtual method binding. And what that concept means is that uh, whether, the, whether the, the program should figure out which method to, to execute at compile time versus at runtime. Uh, long story short is virtual means pick the method at runtime 
And what that really means is if you sort of have a collection of employees, but some of them are lawyers and some of them are doctors and some of them are secretaries, it'll actually at runtime ask each object, which method do you have? Which one should I really call? Rather than calling the common base version of the same method. But anyway, whatever. Like the, the sort of simple version of this is if you say virtual, it allows the method to be overridden by subclasses. Uh, I think I mentioned briefly in last lecture that even if you don't say virtual, the compiler will allow you to override a method it will allow that, it won't make an error, but the problem is that then in a lot of cases it won't actually use that new version of the method that you have written in the subclass. So it basically doesn't do what you want. And I'll try to illustrate that. I haven't quite got a running program yet to illustrate some of those things. So okay, that's kind of where we're at so far. So then, um, where am I? Uh, here, so we talked about overriding a method, we talked about how you want this keyword virtual, okay fine. Next thing is, if you want to have a subclasses constructor call a superclasses constructor, we have this weird syntax where, you know, in Java, inside these curly braces, you would have just said call super, and then in parentheses, you would have passed the arguments you want to pass. But in C++, instead, like, this colon, I think the way you're supposed to think of it is like when you say colon something, it kind of means like this is based on that. So this constructor is kind of based on calling this other constructor with these other parameters. And then after that, if there's anything more you want to do, you put it in the curly braces. So the example that I was giving was, what if the employee class, uh, the employee class has a name and a number of years that the employee has worked at the company? And then those are fields that get initialized in the constructor. So if I look at the constructor, it sets the object's name and the object's years equal to these values that you pass in here, right? Okay, so if you have a lawyer that's a subclass of an employee, and the lawyer takes the same you know, name and years that they've worked at the company, but the lawyer also remembers what law school that they went to. So may maybe all three of those are parameters to the constructor. So maybe you'd have something like private uh, string law school, or I guess I'd call it my law school, to match the other file. So now in the lawyer constructor, what you do is you say, well, this constructor is based on calling that constructor with this name and this number of years. So it basically calls super with those two parameters. And then after that, you would say something like, you know, my law school equals law school. So this is the part here that's unique to the lawyer constructor. And you might say, well, I don't want to do this. This is dumb. Maybe I'll just say my name equals name, my years equals years. That's just me setting all three of the fields directly. It doesn't let you do this um, because, oh, no target for what? I think I have some stray file that I have to refresh here. Let me try again. Yeah, but I think I got rid of that file, didn't I? Okay, there. Uh, well, <laughs> I've got some other problems. I got a lot of problems going on in my life, but uh, currently this is uh, not okay. It doesn't let me directly set those. Uh, do you understand why? Like, a lawyer does have a variable inside of it called mining, and it does have a variable inside of it called my years because it inherited those from employee. However, I'm not allowed to set the values in the constructor here. Do you know why that is? <coughs> yes? Because they're private and not public or protected. Yeah, that's right, because the, these variables are declared as private in the parent class, in the employee class. Subclasses are not allowed to access private things from the superclass. Even though they have those things, they aren't allowed to look at them. Uh, the reason for that is similar in Java. It's that we don't want to allow subclasses to violate the encapsulation of the class they're extending. So, okay, so I can't do this, but if I can call the employee constructor, the employee constructor will do that for me. So basically that's why I do it this way. Now some people have asked, well, instead of this syntax, could I just write like employee? Name, years, just put it in there, make it look more like normal code or something? Uh, <laughs> That doesn't work because technically that constructs an anonymous object of type employee and then throws it away. <laughs> it doesn't initialize me to have those name and years. So just, you just got to do it this way. Let me put it back. You have to do it like that. Okay, that's how C++ does this. So just do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So is there a way to, to, to use the same syntax for like for, for other methods? Oh, is there a way to use this syntax elsewhere? Uh, I don't think you can do it for other methods. This is um, you can use this even when you're not doing inheritance, uh, it's called an instance initializer list. Uh, 
like up in the super class, the employee super class, there's no inheritance here, right? It's not a subclass of anybody. You can do like this. You can do colon my name name, my ears years, and then there's nothing in here. Uh, and what this means is like basically initialize this to be that, and initialize this to be that. Now you might say, why is that better than what I had before with the equal statements? Uh, certain kinds of fields, like particularly fields that are references, have to be initialized with this syntax or else they don't get initialized properly, but it's kind of a weird like C++ crap thing. So I have not chosen to go into great detail about it, but basically you can use this colon syntax elsewhere, but the main place that I want to make sure you know about it is when you call one constructor from another, because that's basically the only way to properly make sure all three fields of this lawyer got initialized properly, okay? So, cool on that? Question about constructors? Okay, well, um, let's keep going. So I think I did this already. If you have a subclass version of a method, like an overridden version of a method, and you want to call a superclass version, you just write the superclass name, colon, colon, and then the method name, and it'll call it. There is no like super keyword in C++. Like, these are places where Java would have used the super keyword. Um, other languages have other keywords to represent that concept. C++ doesn't have one, so you just write the class name. Yes? So this whole like um, nuance with how you I guess, construct these attributes, is it because you sort of inherited those attributes from the superclass rather than creating your own, as in the case of the law school? Which is like here? Yeah, um, the reason I have to do this this way is because the name and the years, which are called my name and my years in terms of the private variables, I did not declare those, my superclass did. And my superclass, by inheriting from that superclass, I have those variables, but the superclass has demanded that they be private only to them. So even though I have them, only that class can write code that manipulates them. So uh, I have to call their code to set their values. Whereas law school, I declared inside the lawyer class uh, right there. So that's why I can directly uh, modify it, yeah. When you call the employee constructor, can you do like years minus one or like some function call instead of that? Yeah, sure, I could use years times two minus three or you know some expression. I'm basically passing these two parameters to the employee constructor and it's using those values to initialize whatever. So yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, you have two questions, you and then you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do we have a super which is, like, can we just call super stuff? There's no such keyword as super in C++, unfortunately. Well, name and years are, are, in this context, are these parameters that are passed to the constructor. Versus in the, in the um, employee, the field names are my name and my years. <laughs> right, so right now, since they're private, the lawyer cannot directly access them. But if the superclass has methods that like return their values, I can call those methods. And then that would allow me to ask what my years are by calling years methods. So it's like a read-only, it's pretty common OOP stuff, right? You have a private field, but a public method to return the value of that field, right? And then your question. Um, what if you want to call the constructor of your superclass with something that is, with, 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 with an expression that is too complex to write in right there? Oh, I see. That's such as you want to, that's to like loop over right. the characters of name. Yeah, you want to you want to like yeah. build some crazy string and then pass that. Yeah, you'd write a method called like helper paren paren oh, down yeah. there that does that and then oh, call the method right there. That's so what you do. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I mean, also this stuff is is fairly straightforward. It's just kind of like how does C do these things I already know how to do in Java or Python or JavaScript or whatever, right? Um, okay. So let's keep going a little bit. Um, a few other things I want to say about inheritance while we're on the subject. There are places you don't want to use inheritance. I think some people, once they learn about inheritance, they, they sort of over apply it to solve different kinds of problems. And they say, oh, okay, well, I have a class that almost does what I want, but I want something a little different than that or something a little more than that, so I'll extend it. Sometimes that's the right idea, sometimes not. But like, here are some examples that I will claim uh, you shouldn't use inheritance for. So imagine you have a point class that stores an x and a y, it's a two-dimensional coordinate, and I say, oh, I want a 3D point. I want one with a Z coordinate. So let's extend point 2D and make a point 3D. And I'll just add the Z coordinate. Now I have all three, right? Another example would be, uh, I have a rectangle class that has a width and a height. Squares are a subset of rectangles. So I'll make a square class. And I'll just call the rectangle constructor and I'll pass the same width as height and now I have a square. 
cool. And I don't have to rewrite all the code that a rectangle has inside of it. So that's, you know, you could use inheritance for that. Or some people like it the other way. They want square to be the superclass and rectangle to be uh, whatever. But um, you could also have one called sorted vector where, um, you know, you have a normal vector. You can add elements anywhere you want, any order you want. But I want vectors that are sorted so that no matter where you add the element, it'll always keep the elements in sorted order. So I'll extend vector and I'll write sorted vector. I'll override the add method to put the place, you know, put the element in the right place, you know, so it'll be sorted. So my claim is that all of these are bad places to use inheritance, even though they might initially seem like good ideas. Uh, do you have any sense of why this might be bad to use inheritance in these situations? You're like, these sound pretty good. I like these. Uh-oh. Uh, hmm. What's the problem here? What do you think? Yeah. Um, almost all the methods you implement are like internal things that need to be redone in this subclass. What needs to be redone? You said methods would need to be redone. Like if you're doing, which one of these, can you think of an example of that? Um, I mean, anytime you work with the sorted vector, you're, you're going to need to be careful to keep it in sorted order. Anytime you work with the point 3D, you're going to need to rewrite these vectors to work with the D chord. Yeah, the example I always think of with the point class is like distance. You know, if you have two points and you want to calculate the distance between them, it's the xy distance. So you do the square root of the um, dx squared plus dy squared or something like that. But now if you have a 3D point, instead of just being this kind of distance, the 3D point could be over here. So you have a third dimension. It's a different formula. But now um, code can get confused. Like if you call the distance between a 2D point and a 3D point or difference between a 3D point and a 2D point, like there's a lot of weird cases that it might do the wrong thing or it might be confusing. You might have to rewrite the code. It might actually be buggy in certain cases. It might, uh, you know, produce a different result if you pass the arguments in a different order, which sounds bad. So yeah, that seems uh, unfortunate. What I always think of with this rectangle example is like the rectangle has a width and a height. It probably has a method like set height or set width or something, right? So now if it's a square, if you extend a rectangle and you set width, did you break the square? Or do you make set width also call set height to keep it square? But like you might say, well, I fixed it. It's square again. You know, if, if, you, if I override set width to change height too, if I override set height to change the width too, now I, it's always going to be a square. It's not going to break anything. But I think a person who is handed a, a rectangle object, but secretly it's a square object, when they call set width, they don't expect the height to change. It's surprising to them if that happens. You know what I mean? So you're, you're, you're making this class that is sort of surprising to the client that uses the class. Um, sorted vector, same thing. Like, uh, you know, vector has an insert method that takes an index and a value, right? OK, so uh, if I hand you a vector object, but secretly it's a sorted vector object, so you call insert at index 2, you put this value. But, but now, like, I override insert to put it at the right sorted position. That seems okay. I, I kept the thing sorted, right? So okay, fine. But what's wrong? It sounded like you you were going to jump in. Did you want to say something about what's bad about that scenario? Like you added an okay, extra. If you're writing code that relies on knowing where you inserted it, and then you look there, and it's actually a sorted vector, it's not going to be there. Yeah, exactly. Like if I insert something at index two, and then I immediately ask the vector what's at index two, I totally expect it to be the thing that I just inserted, right? <laughs> and then I insert something, and somebody else is there. Like, what? <laughs> what is that? I, that's not what I just wrote. So these uh, examples can surprise the client that's using the code. Uh, there is a principle called the Liskov substitutability principle. Uh, Google Barbara Liskov. She's a Turing Award winner. Uh, a, I believe she's the first female Turing Award winner. I might be wrong about that. But she, she came up with these, some of these important OOP concepts about um, you know, places you shouldn't use inheritance. The idea to her was like, if you can't substitute in the one for the other without astonishment, then it's a bad use of inheritance. So all these things we're talking about are places where if you substitute in the subclass object, it would do weird stuff that the client would not be expecting. So you, you generally should find a different way to implement this sort of functionality. Maybe just keep the point 3D separate. Maybe just keep the square separate. Sometimes people have a trick where they sort of make a superclass called like rectangular shape <laughs> or quadrilateral or something, and then both of these guys extend that. So you can find a way to share the code without saying that either one of them is a subclass of the other. So yeah, you basically just keep these things separate. So uh, there is a mechanism in C++ called private inheritance. 
I'm not going to do a lot of uh, talk about this today. I just want you to know about it. It's where you do extend a class and you do inherit all the code from that class, but none of the outside code can tell that your class is related to the other class. So it's kind of like you get a copy of the code, but like if somebody, like if lawyer privately extended employee, you would not be able to put a lawyer into a vector of employees because the outside code wouldn't understand that lawyer was related to employee. So the idea there is you share code without getting these kind of um, uh, you know, inheritance mix-ups in the client code. I think mostly this is a bad feature. <laughs> I, I think if you want to do this, you're probably doing something wrong. So I, I don't like private inheritance. Most languages don't have this concept. It's like if you, if you inherit, you just have to shout it to the world. You have to be open about where your superclass comes from in most programming languages. Uh, whatever. So that's there. Uh, I also briefly talked about this in last lecture. So uh, a virtual, a pure virtual function is a function that you declare virtually and you set its value to zero. And the idea of doing that, it's basically like setting it to null. It means that your class doesn't have that function in it, but you demand that any subclass of your class will write that function. So this is very similar to um, what feature in Java? Yes? It's like an abstract function, right. And if you did a whole bunch of these, it would be like having a Java interface. So those two features of Java are this same concept where you don't write the method, but you demand that someone else writes the method later. Um, now, this is useful if you have a method that all the subclasses should have in it, but every subclass is gonna do it in a different way so that it wouldn't really make sense for the superclass to try to write the method. I guess if this feature didn't exist in the language, you could just set it to be an empty set of curly braces that did nothing. But that would be unfortunate because then you might have some subclasses that forgot to override the method and then they don't have an implementation of that code. Question, yeah? Does it have to be zero or can you just write no? I believe you have to write zero. Um, and that, all the code I see has a zero. Yeah, not a null. Um, because I think, I forgot, we could try it real quick. Uh, I'm wrong about half the time when it comes to C++, but uh, so what are we doing here? We're gonna say employee.h, we're gonna say the speak method is set to null pointer. I don't think that works. Yeah, see it says invalid pure specifier, only zero is allowed. Oh really, okay, well what if, I think if you say null like this, null is literally a macro that re, that is replaced by zero, so I think that might work. No, <laughs> no, you have to use really zero. It's very picky. Uh, it makes you use zero, like exactly a zero. What if I said uh, define Marty zero <laughs> equals Marty? Yeah, I gotcha, it works, ha ha ha. Um, <laughs> let's never speak of this again. Uh, another question, yeah. Um, in Java, you can like implement multiple interfaces. Yeah. You do the similar thing with like pop instead of only have pure virtual functions. Right, right, so uh, I think my next slide will talk about what you're asking. Um, what if you wanna, in Java you have these interfaces, you can implement them, you're basically, it's a lot like this kind of feature. You can say, I promise I'll implement all the methods that are declared in those super interfaces. Um, C++ does not have interfaces. So if you want something that's just purely demands on subtypes, you have to do what's called a pure virtual class. So let's say you were gonna write a class called, sh a, a bunch of shape classes, okay? You can have triangles and rectangles and circles and all kinds of stuff, and every shape has an area, double area, and every shape also has a perimeter. But the way you calculate it is different from shape to shape. So you sort of don't want to write anything for them here. This would be totally an interface in Java land, right? So what you do here is you'd say, well, equals zero, equals zero here in C++. So, but you can't say interface shape, you just have to say class shape. Okay, so now if you want to write like a rectangle class, you do like class rectangle, you know, extends public shape, and then you'd have to write these methods, right? Okay, but, you know, when you extend a class in Java, you might know that you can only extend one class, right? And so that's part of the reason Java has interfaces. You can only extend one class, but you can implement any number of interfaces. Uh, C++ doesn't have interfaces, so you can extend as many classes as you want. So let me see, is that my next slide? Where is it? C++ has multiple inheritance. You can extend 
a class, and then extend another class, and then extend another class, and then extend another class. You can extend as many parent classes as you want. That might sound really cool. It's a horrible idea. Because it's, well, I mean, sorry, it's not always horrible. It's just that what ends up happening is your code, it just dramatically can increase the complexity of your code. It also can lead to confusing ambiguity, like if both of your parent classes have a method called like get x, well, then which one do you get? The answer is you get both of them. But now how does code that wants to use your class differentiate between the two? Ugh, it's a big mess, I don't even want to talk about it. But there are places where it can be useful. This concept of like grabbing code from multiple places and kind of putting them into your class, that has occurred in other languages since then. Uh, Ruby is an example, the popular web language Ruby, they have this concept called mix-ins that's very similar to multiple inheritance, where you sort of take, <coughs> take features from other places and like paste them into your class, and now your class has those features. Um, but anyway, this feature is used in the C++ libraries, like uh, the input and output stream classes have this pretty complicated inheritance tree where they're like all extending each other and uh, it's kind of some like, uh, looks like the Targaryen family tree on Game of Thrones at the end of it all or something, you know, and uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> look, look it up. But anyway, most programming languages that are object oriented do not support multiple inheritance because um, it leads to these kind of weird bugs and it makes code harder to reason about. It's also harder for the compiler to optimize in some cases. So it got banned from Java and most other Go languages don't, don't uh, allow it. Yeah. Would you then suggest just sort of merge into two superclasses into one larger one? And then just, Sorry. Would you, say, like, would you suggest alternatives as in like merging two superclasses into just one large superclass? Oh, I see. Like how would you avoid this if yeah. you didn't want to do this? Well, look, uh, maybe one thing I haven't said, and this might go back to my examples like the 3D point and stuff. Like if you have a class that you think is similar to this thing and it's kind of similar to that thing and it's like should I extend both of those things, there's kind of this, uh, this, this rule um, where people say, uh, you know, favor, favor composition over inheritance. Um, this is another, I believe this is from Barbara Liskov as well. Composition just means if you're like a vector, if you're similar, if what you want to do is like what a vector does, you don't have to like be a vector by extending vector. Just declare a private vector inside of you and use it. If you're kind of like a point, if your 3D point is kind of like a point and you want to share that code, declare a point inside of you as a private member and use it. So I think that you were talking about, well, can I take the two classes I'm similar to and can I merge them? Sure, you could potentially do that, but maybe they're not like each other. So maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe I should just declare each of them as a private field inside of me. So uh, the analogy I always heard is like uh, dentist and lawyer and and garbage man and stuff, and it's like, I want all of that stuff. So I'm gonna go to dental school and law school and I'm gonna learn how to pick up garbage because I'm gonna be all of those things. It's like, no, I don't need to be those things. I just, I need to have access to those things. So I'll declare a private dentist that I have to go to once every few months. And I'll declare a private lawyer that I can call when I wanna sue somebody's ass. So, you know, you don't need to be those things if you wanna use those things. <laughs> What's a garbage man for? Well, they pick up the garbage. Sorry, a uh, garbage person. There we go. Uh, yeah, equal opportunity. So, yeah, anyway, I'm just kind of rambling about different aspects of inheritance here, but I just want you to know that C++ does have this feature. I don't really want to go into all the different syntax for how to disambiguate overrides and stuff like that. If the overlie, over, if you inherit two versions of the same method, like I don't, I don't really want to show all that syntax. If you're curious, you can Google C++ multiple inheritance. Uh, question, yeah? What happens when you try to construct this? Oh, um, if, if you have a class that has one of these zero functions, pure virtual, and then you try to construct a shape object, uh, I, I'm almost positive that the compiler will say, no, you cannot instantiate um, the pure virtual class. The class itself becomes a pure virtual class, uh, and it's uninstantiable, basically. Even if it also has non Yeah, even if it has some behavior that isn't zero, okay. it just won't allow you. Basically, it thinks of it as being an incomplete entity, incomplete class. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to, there's a few more slides on this topic called polymorphism, but I want to jump to uh, talk about hashing for a little while first. I may come back to the polymorphism stuff. Um, so I want to jump to my other slides. Where is it? Here, hashing. So uh, this stuff, we're not going to finish this today, but I just want to intro it, You do a little more on it in section, and then we'll do more on this on Friday. Uh, it comes from chapter 15 of the book. 
The, the main topic here is I want to talk about how some of the uh, collections are implemented. We're kind of trying to wrap that up and learn almost every collection that we used, you know, learn how it was built on the inside. So I think hashing is really cool. It was hard for me to understand when I first learned about it, but uh, I'm not as smart as you guys. So it's in chapter 15 of the book. So, okay, let's talk about this. The main concept of, that we're trying to figure out is what would be a good way to implement a set? Uh, I'm thinking of like, we're gonna get to a hash set basically, but let's just brainstorm. How do you implement a set? Well, you could just have internally have like a, a, a vector or an unfilled array, you know, one of these resizing arrays kind of. So when people wanna add things to the set, you could just store them in the last element like this, right? Just kind of unordered or order of insertion, right? So how, what's the big O? Of, the three methods that a set is really uh, needing to be good at is add, remove, and search. That's what a set does. Everything else is just frosting on top of that, right? So like, what's a big O of add in this model? Big O of one, just add to the end, no shifting. If I have to resize every so often, that's okay. It doesn't break a big O. What's a big O of contains? I got a loop over all of them to look for, right? So it's N, that's not very good. Sets need to be fast for contains. O of N for a single contains check is back. Okay, remove, how long does that take? I gotta look for it again, right? We go event. So mostly this sucks, right? This is okay for adding, but it's mostly not good for the stuff you really want. Okay, that's no good. Okay, well, what about um, what about a sorted array? Same idea, but we just put everything in sorted order. If you say that you want to add, uh, you know, forty-nine, you'll put it at the end. If you say you want to add eight, I'll put it here. Just I'll shift people as needed and put it so that everything stays in sorted order. How long does it take to add an element? We go. O of n squared. squared. Well, so what do I have to do, right? I have to find the right place to insert it, right? And then once I have found that place, I might need to shift people over and then I put the element there, right? How long, so there's two tasks, find the spot and then make room for the thing, right? How long does it take to find the spot? I can jump around using a binary search to find the right spot, right? That takes log of n, as you guys should know, so that's not too bad. But then if I find that the right spot is here, I have to shift people over, how long does shifting take? Uh, it can take as much as n. On average, I might have to shift half the element. So it's kind of log plus n, which means just n. So adding is big O of n. Searching, how long does it take to search? Log, I use a binary search. That's good, that's better. Even though the adding is slower, that search speed up is really useful. Okay, so that's good. Log in search. Remove, how long does it take to remove? And well, I use the log search to find the thing you want me to remove, but then once I remove him, I have to slide people over, that takes in. So add and remove are really slow in this model, but searching is faster. So some pros and some cons to this, it still isn't very good, right? Okay, then um, we also have, uh, not pictured on the slides today, we also have the binary search tree, right? Add, remove, contains, how long do those take on a binary search tree? They all take log, assuming the tree is pretty well balanced. We've talked about that a little bit. Um, so that's log, log, log for the three operators. That's actually pretty good. That's the best thing we've seen so far. I want to show you an, a fourth option, another option, okay? What if when you added a value and the value that you're adding was i, I just stored it in the array at index i, okay? So just, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not mushing everybody over to the left edge or anything. Just you say add seven, I'll put it at index seven. Okay? You add uh, nine, I'll put it at index nine. You added one, I'll put it at index one. How long does it take to add an element if you do that? It takes O of one because, you know, to jump to an index of an array, even a large index does not take any uh, time. You just jump straight to there. So that takes a constant amount of time. How long does it take to search to see if something is in the set? You just jump to the index and see if it's there or if a zero is there. That would take a constant amount of time. How long would it take to remove something and set it back to zero? O of one, O of one, O of one. Wow, that sounds great. There's just a small problem with this idea. Uh, can you think of any problems with the idea? A lot of random. Yeah? Run out of memory? Yeah, I think that, of course, the, 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 another way of phrasing that problem would be like, well, what if you want to add a 10? There's no index for that. Oops, okay, well, maybe I'll make the array bigger so there is a 10. I'll make it size 20 and I'll put the 10 there. Okay, fine, so now I can store values up to 20. Now you add a 28. Oops, I have to resize up to 40. Okay, so I just make the array bigger to 
contain the range of all the values that you want to talk about. So if your values were in a certain range that wasn't that big, this wouldn't be so bad. But you said out of memory. So I think what you're probably implying is like, what if I have a number that's like a three and I have a number that's like one billion? <laughs> I have to make an array of size a billion and mostly is empty. So that seems like, oops, that's not very memory efficient, right? So yeah, that's a problem. That's a pretty big problem. But, but I like this big old one stuff. So maybe we could try to patch the problem rather than just abandoning this weird idea. You know, question? Yeah, the key idea of what we need to do here is we need to find a way to take values that we want to store and sort of map them to specific indexes at which it would be best to store them. And if the values that we are storing in the set are ints, it's somewhat trivial to come up with that mapping because the mapping is store the number as an index equal to that number. But what if this idea, I think you're, you're describing a problem, a potential problem here. What if I'm storing the streets? What if I'm storing the doubles? What if I'm storing 3D point objects, how does this concept generalize to other types of data? I want to. That's a very important question. I want to come back to it, but uh, we'll have to figure that out if this idea has any merit. But this idea of like store the elements at specific places without having to search for anything, this idea is called hashing. And all the problems that you raised have reasonable solutions. So if we can fix all the little problems, this is a cool idea. Okay. So let's keep working on it. Let's keep thinking. So if you add numbers that are bigger, maybe I make the array bigger. I think taken out to infinity, that doesn't work because you know there's such a range of ints. We don't want a, 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 an array that's got billions of indexes, most of which are empty. That's, that's a problem. But let's keep moving, see if we can figure some of these things out. So OK, like I said, this idea is called hashing. Hashing is when you map a set of values that's big into a smaller domain of indexes that's small. So we are starting out by mapping the entire range of int into a set of array indexes. Um, so if you're going to use an array to store data in this way, we could refer to the array as a hash table. The array in my diagram on the last slide, we could call that array a hash table. A hashing function is a, literally a C++ function where you pass in a piece of data and it returns out an index to put that piece of data. So where should this thing get stored? Store it at this index. That mapping from value to index is called a hashing function. The sort of hashing function we came up with was kind of trivial. It was like, here's the int n, where should I store it? Store it at index n. <laughs> That's kind of what we started with. But you could have something a little more complicated than that if you want. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the actual index where you're told to go put the thing, we call that a hash code, or you know, just call it an index if you want to. Okay? All these th terms are terms that get used when you're doing this kind of uh, uh, collection building. OK, so we came up with this function, hash code i gets stored at index i. What are the drawbacks? We already sort of talked about them. Uh, might need a really big empty array. It wouldn't work for negative numbers because there's no negative indexes in an array. And uh, we could have sparse, you know, where most of the indexes are, are, are empty, right? So let's improve this to make it a little bit better. Um, so one thing we could do is if we see a negative number, we could just take the absolute value. If you want to store a negative 6, I'll store it at index 6. At least it wouldn't go out of bounds that way, right? So you tell me to store a negative 2, I'll store it at index 2. You tell me to store a 37, I'll store it at index 7. So I'm kind of like patching around some of these issues you told me about. And I don't have a giant billion element array anymore. I'll just kind of mod the elements by the capacity. So like if you add something to it that I want to store an array of index size 10, then I'll mod it by 10 to figure out where to put it, right? So in theory, I fixed some of the problems. I have now introduced new problems to replace the old problems, right? Now what's my problem with this? Yeah? If you try to store a negative 2 and a 2, like Yeah. A what if I want to store a 2, and I want to store a negative 2, and I want to store a 1,000 and 2, and a 42, and a, oops, uh-oh. Now we have people who want to compete for the same slot. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, that seems like a problem. Uh, yeah, so what are we going to do about that? Um, just real quickly to review, uh, all three of those operations are going to be big O of 1, right? Because if we have a hash code function that absolute values the number you're storing, <coughs> mods by the array size, then adding, removing, and searching are all just one little line of code, right? So just I want to make sure it's clear that this would all be big O of 1 if we could make this work. So OK, the big problem is what you're referring to is called a collision. Collision is when two values both want the same index. I add a 24, I add a 54. Oops. <laughs> I, 
That's, that's bad. I need to distinguish between those two things. So any hash uh, system that's going to be correct has to have a collision resolution mechanism, has to handle this issue in some way. Well, lots of people have spent lots of years thinking about this, so there are lots of ways people have come up with to deal with this problem. Let me show you some of them. One way is called probing. Probing is just go looking for some other index to store the value. <laughs> so like you store a 24 and it goes in, you know, mod by 10, and the 24 mod 10 is 4, so I put the 24 there. I have 54, so I try to go store in here, oops, it's taken, so I just keep looking forward by one until I find an available index and then I just put them there. So <laughs> it's like just make it somebody else's problem, right? Uh, I don't know, what's a real world analogy of this? It's like you go to, try to go to sleep and your dorm, but your roommate's in there already making noise, doing something you don't want to be around for. So you go to the next dorm, you sleep in that dorm, but then they come home and now you're in their bed, so they sleep in the next dorm. I don't know. Is that what people do? I've never been in a dorm before. I'm like 50 years old. So um, anyway, you move to the next available index. That's what you do, right? If you use this method of resolving collisions, one, this is one method for resolving collisions. There are other methods where instead of just moving to the next by one, maybe you jump by a certain amount. Sometimes you jump by squares of numbers. Jump by plus one, plus four, plus nine, plus 16. You jump by the squares of ints. That way, they're not all next to each other. They're spread out or something. Um, so what do you think about, about this approach? Or did, or did you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this would be affected by the order of which you add numbers, right? Because if you add a very late probing result that's true, it does mean the order you add the elements affects where they end up, but it doesn't matter so much to me where they end up in here as long as add, remove, and contains behave correctly to the user of this set. So like if they say, does this set contain 54? And I go here and I don't see 54, I need to update my contains code to look and see if he's in the next slot or the one after that or the one after that. But if I patch that up until it works, as long as it gives the right answer, like it says true when I did add a 54, and it says false when I didn't add a 54, as long as it behaves properly, I don't particularly care internally where everybody is at, as long as it behaves properly. By the way, you know how when you have a hash set and you print it, it's all jumbled up weird, and you don't know why the order is weird? It's doing, it like takes the stuff you put in there and it mods it into some index of some array, and then when you print the thing, it just loops over the array, and whatever that order happens to be, that's the order that it prints. That's why it prints in like a weird order. Um, <clears throat> anyway, whatever. So as long as it works, I think I'm okay with that aspect. But yeah, this does mean, if we do this, it means that we'll have to update the code for add and remove and contains. We'll have to make sure that add walks forward if needed. We'll have to make sure that contains looks forward until an empty slot if needed. And remove might have to look forward to find the thing to remove it, right? Um, if you're a big O uh, purist, you might say, wait a minute. Uh, if I have to like go here and then start walking ahead and stuff, like doesn't that mean I have a loop now? And doesn't that mean it's not as big O of one E as it used to be and stuff? So you end up with what's called a clustering problem where maybe you have a whole bunch of people backed up. I should have called this the 101 freeway problem or something. I don't know. Um, you guys probably don't drive cars. Never mind. The old people have these things called cars, and sometimes there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it looks like this kind of. Anyway, uh, if you add a bunch of elements, all of which need to go in the same similar part of the hash table, they all get mushed together. And the problem with this issue is like, if you say, hey, uh, hash set, do you contain 74? then I have to start here, nope, not him, but I need to keep looking in case he got probed. So okay, nope, not him, not him, not him, not him, not him, not him. Oops, uh, finally I get to here. You actually have to wrap these uh, things around if needed, right? So to find a spot. And so all that I have to look at to see that there isn't a 74 in here. So oops, that's not cool, that's bad. Now this example is kind of crafted as much as possible to break the code, you know, to make it have a really long cluster. Um, Mostly, if you have a hash table like this, you don't just make it have size 10. That's a nice initial size for a vector or array list or something. But a hash set, you'd probably make it have a bigger, like 100 or 200 or something, just to give you a little more space. So like, if you had a hash set of size 100, a lot of these guys wouldn't want to be an index 4 anymore. You know what I mean? Like 24 would be an index 24 in a size 100 hash table and 37 would be an index 37 in a size 100 hash table. Or even if it were size 20 hash table, you'd see that 37 would be over at 17. 
versus, uh, you know, I don't know what, but they would, they would be split up a little more. They would be less clustered than this if the hash table were bigger, right? Another trick that is often used with this is, you know, I happen to have chosen a multiple of 10 because we like multiples of 10 because of our little fingers and toes and stuff. But if I had chosen the hash table size to be like 73, then the modding and wrapping around and stuff is not very evenly distributed. So a lot of times people pick like weird sizes for these arrays to make the, the mod by capacity have less collision. Uh, yeah, question. So we use, if we're implementing our hash table with probing, I understand if we're just adding elements, we know when to stop looking, like once we hit a blank index. Yeah. But if we've removed an index, like let's say we have to probe forward 10 spaces and remove something forward five spaces, doesn't that mean when we're searching, we have to, when do we know when to stop searching? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, question. Um, what if I tell it that I want to remove, like I have this data here, and then I say I want to remove 14. So it's going to say, where's 14? It's probably in index four. No, okay, I'll probe ahead. Oh, here he is. I'll send him back to zero. I remove him. That seems like that's the right implementation of removal. But now later, if I ask whether the hash table, wait, did I choose a good example? No, choose 54. Uh, I'll do 54. I'll remove him. I remove this guy. So now after removing him and zeroing him out, Later, somebody says, does this set contain 14? So I will start here at its natural location. That's not him. Then I go to here, I see it's zero, and I might stop searching. So oops, I would miss that he was there. So that's actually an important bug. If you're actually going to write this code, you have to do something where on removal, you don't store a zero, you store some sort of like junk value. Like there used to be a 54 here, but now it's junk. It'd be like a null value or a constant int that's out of bounds, or you'd have to store some kind of value here to indicate, like, keep searching. There used to be something here, but now it's been removed from here. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, though. Um, anyway, this, this has some pros and some cons. The clustering can be a problem um, with this. Now, uh, oh, was there another, did I see another hand up before I move on? Yeah. So, uh, so why would clustering slow it down again? Why would clustering slow things down? Because the whole point of this was that when we want to add, remove, or contains on this, we can just jump to the right index and just find something. If you want to know whether 14 is there, you just jump to index four. Uh, and that's why it's big old one, that's why it's fast. But if you have to start at four and then look ahead arbitrarily far to find 14, then if you have a lot of clusters, it means you're looping a lot to look for things. And the whole point of this representation was to avoid lots of looping to look but for things. it seems like if, if, you had, if you had, say, like less clusters and things spread out more, then would you have to like search for like, like more um, if you have fewer clusters like this, yeah. you don't have to loop a lot. I mean, if you're looking for 37, the whole point is he's not going to be in any of these other indexes. You just start at 7 and see if he's there, because 7 is his special index. His, his hash code would send you to index 7, yeah, and it wouldn't send you to any of those other places. Why would, why would you know that? Why would you know that you don't have to look around? Well, the reason you know you don't have to look around is like, say I search for, say I ask for 87, and I, I say, okay, well, his index should be uh, 87 mod uh, 10, which is 7, so I'll go here. You asked for 87, and I found 37. Nope, it's not here. Well, so then I'll look in the next index. Is that an 87? Nope, it's a 0. If you see a 0, you can just stop. Because 0 means, like, if there had been an 87, I would have put it there, and there's no one there. Therefore, there's no 87 anywhere. So kind of you just start and walk till a zero. So, 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 so this thing is assuming it's, it's like linear probing? It's yeah. Probing. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming I'm doing linear probing here, yeah. Anyway, uh, I want to show you another way of doing things, which is where instead of moving to the next index, another approach would be that in each index, instead of storing just a value, you could store a collection of values. <laughs> you could store a linked list of values or a something, a vector of values, whatever. This approach is nice because it doesn't ever have like a, uh, a, a table that wraps around, you have to look at every single value or something like that. It's just, if you go to index 4 to store 24, you just put him into the linked list, and then if you want to store 54 later or something, you just add him to the linked list. Actually, usually what you do is you insert them at the front, because that's faster. But now, uh, adding is still fast. You don't have to look at any other indexes. You can just add it to the front of the linked list of, of interest. Searching, you have to loop through the thing, so whatever the length of that is, is your runtime for that. And then removal is anything you have to look for it and then remove it. So now it's a little faster than before in the sense that um, you know mostly these are going to be spread out. Now again, my picture has a list that's of length three, so that looks kind of bad. But really with real data, you have a bigger hash table. The element's usually more spread out. 
So you're more, more likely to have a bunch of chains with one or two things in them. So if the chains are short enough, even if you have to loop over two or three objects, that's really nothing. And so that's basically still keeps us at big O of one. So that's called separate chaining. This is what is done in the hash set and the hash map that comes with our Stanford library. It's what's done in the STL. It's what Java does. This is what most hash uh, structures do. Now, um, I'm running out of time. The last thing I'm going to say is, you know, the main, there's a couple bugs left and maybe we can resume on Friday, but the biggest thing we haven't addressed is what if you're not storing ints? How do you take other kinds of data and put them in here? At, how do you come up with a magic index to store a string at or store a point at or whatever? And so I think that really reduces to the problem of can you take the state of the object and turn it into some kind of int that's reproducible? And so you can do all kinds of things for that. Like if it's a string, you can convert all the characters into their little ASCII number codes and then add those up. And then that's the number code for the string, that's its hash code. And then that number mod array size is the index the string should be stored at. So you have to come up with some object, turn it into an int kind of conversion like that. So anyway, I'm gonna stop on that. And in section you can talk more about hashing and hash codes, but we'll resume this uh, on Friday. So I'll see you then, thanks.